after our lifetimes, there's not going to be much left of the record of our lives. So we have to do all we can to instill the truth in children, and yet they're being compounded constantly by lies. Santa Claus and toys and pumpkins and costumes, and everything's a fantasy. But we want to try to instill in our children something that will go down in history that will change things a little, if Yahua tarries. I want to discuss a few origins, like, uh, well, I just ran across this article today, and we, we see a lot of divisions in the world and misunderstandings because people are living according to fantasies. And uh, this article just popped in my hands. I had to make more of them because they're, they're containing an origin of something. And in this case, it's talking about lots of things, but one of the main things it's showing you is the origin of the sighted moon. When people say, it's a new moon. Well, it's not a new moon, it's a new month. And, it, and the light that's on the moon helps us to determine and confirm what we're looking at as far as the record of time. It's a, there's a record in the book of Barashith or Genesis that we're to use the two great lights to determine events, appointed times, when the day begins and when the day ends, and when years happen, and they're for years. And they're not for weeks, though. The lights in the sky are not for weeks. A week, the, the, the creation week, was itself something that was t creating time. So we have a seven-day week. Even China has a seven-day week, and it happens to be the same seven days. And Rome didn't have anything to do with China at all. You know, they didn't, that was already going on, you know, so what happened at Babel? You know, the origin of confusion itself, the Tower of Babel, and the reason that our languages are confused. It had an origin, and that's what interests me, and I'm sure many of you. Where did this start? When you hear teachers talking in your ear, and they're telling you something, have they tracked it to its origin as far as where they th understand what they understand, it, you know, where it originated, that's normally not the case. Because I've asked many people to tell me where they heard this and what started it, and they don't know. The teacher that's teaching whatever it is. I had a guy call me on the phone uh, before the turn of the century in 1998 or so. And he said, Lou, I think some something's happening. Uh, he worked on at night and on a farm, and he said, I think the moon's trying to talk to me. And I said, what, what's it telling you? And he said, well, it's, it's telling me what day of the month it is. And in a way, he's right. However, when you get off on the wrong foot and you start with the wrong thing, you track it down in Scripture and you go, hey, this teaching isn't in here. Where'd you get it? And I wanted to know, too. So, sighted moon origins. Where did that start? It happened to have a, be have a beginning. And it happened in Babel during an argument that I describe in here. Between, and I mentioned it slightly in the last video, in the 8th century CE. And that's, you know, uh, 1,200 years ago, uh, something like that. So, we, we really can't say that it's scriptural, you know, it's not in the scriptures, a sighted moon, and they have a process to find it. But there is a reason for it, and I tracked it down and explained it in this article, and it happens to be an Islamic thing, but even that had an origin. They picked that up from Hinduism and their deities. I'll put a picture up here so that you can see the crescent moon on one of their deities. They had a trinity in Hinduism. Anyway, the 
you have to track this stuff to its origins. And in Babel in the 8th century CE, that's where the Crescent sighting started. And it was a sect of the Yahudim that was having an argument. And his, uh, the older brother didn't get, the, get elected for the chief rabbinate or whatever. And the, uh, the younger brother won. And they didn't use a crescent, but the people that lorded over them, the, these Islamic people, there was a caliph, an Islamic caliph, that uh, decided the case, you know, to let the guy live. So he adopted the crescent sighting, and he, he won. Uh, his life is what he won. But he started a sect called the Karaites. Today, that's what they're called. They're actually Karaim, the readers. And they really don't like people saying the name. So they invented these Masoretic texts. The Masorets were a Karait sect. And they started in, a, in some place too. The origin of the Masoretic text is Babel. And it was in the 9th century. That's the oldest actual writings that exist of the Masoretic text. The 9th century CE, so it was the same group in Babel that were, that were having the, uh, they came up with the uh, crescent sighting for their sect. Of course, the crescent sighting was going on in paganism all along. But um, now what else? The oldest Hebrew text, and when we say Hebrew, we're not talking Aramaic, we're talking Hebrew. The name of Yahuwah, I'll put it up here in Hebrew, and it doesn't look like Aramaic. The oldest Hebrew text is 10th century BCE, and it actually exists. It, it, it's found in Shomeron, where they, what they call Samaria. The Samaritan script is what they usually refer to it as, but it's re really the Hebrew, and it's called the Kerbet Kayafa inscription. Try to say that three times. Now, the Aramaic script, that's what you see in the Masoretic script. But where did that start? Well, it derived from Babel. <laughs> Again, in the 6th century BCE, with the returning Yahudim, with Nehemiah, or Nehemiah, when they were rebuilding the walls and the temple. Well, that's the origin of when they adopted the Aramaic script. It was already going on in Babel. You know, the handwriting on the wall was in Hebrew, but the people in Babel couldn't read that. So, you know, they called Daniel. And it was brought back from the Babylonian captivity, Aramaic. So, you know, when you say these things, people go, wait a minute, that, that's going to expose my error if you just let this out here. But I like to find the origins. I'm not attacking people. I would never do that because I know what it feels like. Uh, I, I'm just interested in letting people know the truth and origins are a good place to start. But uh, when people come up with these new teachings and they're coming down the road, especially in the calendar herd, there's a lot of calendar specialists and they're stumbling over themselves. It looks like some kind of a, in my mind, like some kind of a cacophony of, uh, of some kind of outrunning bulls or something. They're just really rolling. And they've got all these new ideas. There's so many new ones. These are, these are all false, and they all seem to fall for all the false ones, the false teachings. Yahushua never, the, the weeks don't determine anything from the sky. The weeks roll through and they started at creation. And the way that the, the uh, tribes of Yisrael had to be retrained in the wilderness for 40 years was the picking up of manna. On the seventh day of each week, there was no manna. Didn't have anything to do with the moon. Otherwise, Yahuwah wouldn't have said, watch for the lack of manna to determine when the seventh day is. In Hebrews 4, we'll tell you that there is a seventh day that the people of Yahuwah are supposed to be observing. It's a day of rest. There's nothing to do on the seventh day. If people say that you have to do something, 
on the seventh day, back off slowly and get out of there. But uh, there's lots of false teachings, and you have to check the scriptures. Be noble, like the Bereans were. Look at scripture and see if these things are so. And if they start going from here and there and putting things together, and the, and the teaching is not clear, then there's something wrong. There's uh, one really obvious proof for the weak not being involved in the month. The uh, thing that happens is uh, you look at Leviticus chapter 23 and you look at the days that transpire between first fruits, which is on the morrow after the Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, and you look at, um, you count for yourselves 50 days. And it's, it, and it's seven weeks, which is seven times seven, 49, up until the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. So you've got 49 days, and the morrow after makes 50, up to 50 days. And that's when Shabuot occurs. So between first fruits and Shabuot, there's your proof. The week rolls through. It has no contact with, it has to contact with a day and a night, but not with the moon. There's, they get wrapped up in that and it gets entangled, but it's not involved. And when a day starts, we're going to look at, into that a little bit too. And there's a website that I have on fossilizedcustoms.com and it's called Moon and there's another one called Day. And you can look at those. I'll try to remember to put the link down below so that you can find a whole list of studies that you can look at on videos and web pages. Well, I want to encourage you to pick up some other downloads, the Sighted Moon Origins tract. And this tract, which is a two-sided one, you've got the complete English, Ten Commandments here, and on the other side, you have the real Hebrew, and it's interlinear. You can read the Hebrew from right to left, and the English meaning of that is, you know, regular English reading. And you can get this downloaded free. And it's called Ten Commandments Insert, because there's a track called Ten Commandments, and then there's the insert. And you can get this for downloaded free, make copies, share it in any way you can, electronically. And I also want to mention that there's a thumb drive. And these babies are like $49.99 at uh, Staples in most stores because they're 64 gigabytes. 64 gigabytes. And I call this the Ambassa Flash. And all you have to do is plug this baby into your flat screen TV in the back and you can use your remote to access the inputs and go to your USB inputs and you can watch this on your flat screen TV. How about that? You don't have to have any special device like a computer or anything, but included in the videos that are on here, there's over a hundred on here, there's over a hundred of these tracks that you can access from your computer. But. Uh, you know, there's over a hundred of them. Um, I'll show you what half of them might look like. No, this is this isn't half. This is more like a third, maybe a fourth, of how many there are on there. They're all mostly four-page tracks, and you'll like it. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll get this up there, and hopefully you'll share it. And remember to like and subscribe to the videos. And make a comment. Let me know what you think. Thanks for watching.